Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And the second reading will be from uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 8 to 14. Let no doubt remain outstanding, except the continuous debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not, you shall not covet, and whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of life, light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, not in debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe, your, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Thanks so much, Leith, for reading to us. And as I said before, tonight um, we're going to be looking at a fairly serious issue together. Uh, the title of the talk is Transformed Relationships, but the thing that inspired this talk was partly uh, something that our Sydney Anglican Synod talked about together last year. As a diocese, we have a set of policies, and one of the policies that Synod was reviewing last year was its policy on domestic abuse. Uh, because as churches, we, we need direction on how we respond to such a challenge in our society and from time to time even in our churches. And so uh, what we're going to do tonight is think about the issue, um, why the issue exists according to scripture, and what scripture offers us, the hope scripture offers us, for how our relationships can be good, wholesome, peaceful, uh, and how we can be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. So uh, I'm going to pray and ask for God's help as we come to this topic, and uh, then let's dive in and think about it together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are love. In you, are we, in you we are reminded there is no darkness at all. We praise you, Father, for the tender love you've displayed to this world in sending your son Jesus and for the way that he demonstrated a love, even for his enemies, in his willingness to lay down his life for them. Lord God, as we consider our own relationships their shortcomings and the problem of violence in our society and the way it infiltrates the homes and institutions of our nation, we pray that you will please give us hearts to understand your word, to receive it, to be reshaped and transformed into the likeness of Christ so that we may relate with your tenderness, compassion, love and gentleness in all our relationships. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last year our synod met in September and passed a motion to review the diocese's policy on domestic abuse. And the importance of the policy was very sadly underscored just a month later 
when Lily James was found murdered in St Andrews Cathedral School by a man she had formerly and briefly dated. Though this murder was particularly shocking, especially for those of us within Anglican churches, many of whom had personal connections to Lily, it was sadly not an isolated event. 64 women lost their lives in similar circumstances in Australia last year. The troubling issue of her death raised the question, why is it that a man who had grown up and been educated in an Anglican church school acted in such a way? More troubling still, the question has been raised, do men, with religious do men within religious organisations perpetrate at a higher rate than men outside of religion, religious organisations? And in the media, you might have noticed this has had a significant roll-on effect. A national debate has begun about the role or uh, justification for single-sex education institutions, and particularly for single-sex education for boys especially in schools run by religious institutions. So there is massive concern and massive scrutiny surrounding the issue of violence. And we find ourselves as God's people um, caught up in the conversation because religious institutions, churches, schools and the people within them are by no means immune from the problem of this violence. Violence in homes and domestic relationships, of course, mirrors violence in our world more broadly. And yesterday's events in Bondi were just such a sad situation. Uh, they've become clearer across the day, haven't they, that mental health does appear to have been uh, the main cause, as far as they can tell at the moment. Only weeks ago, on my way to our 8am service, the road just near the station was cordoned off by police due to a security guard being king hit outside the Royal Pub on the, early on the Sunday morning and uh, the result was that he lost his life. Uh, and we've just talked about the hold up in Loftus. Our world at large is troubled by the reality of war. This evening we've read the news headlines that Iran has launched an attack. It seems ridiculous uh, and yet this is the reality of the world that we live in. Violence, therefore, is a sad fact of life which permeates every tier of society in both the public and private realm. As a nation, therefore, we need no convincing that we have a serious problem to address in the way that we are relating to one another. And as part of our Synod's discussion in 2023 about the issue, the Synod decided to encourage all uh, rectors or ministers to preach and teach regularly on the topic. And I think that's a great thing to, for us to do because it brings it out of the private realm into the public realm or at least the congregational realm where we can say, we have a position on this. The Bible doesn't leave any room for any thought that this is acceptable to God. And the Bible also encourages us, each person, to be transformed in our relationships, in the way that we relate to one another and to take the challenge very, very seriously. Well, as I hope to demonstrate tonight, the Bible brings a very high degree of confidence that it will be possible, even for people like us, even for people like those that we see in our world who are so affected by sin, it's possible for any person who will turn to Christ to be transformed by the power of his spirit. Um, remember the Apostle Paul, himself a violent man, radically transformed by the power of God's Spirit to be a servant of Christ and to live his life serving God and serving others. The Bible gives us great confidence that we are able to conduct our relationships in a manner that is peace-loving, harmonious, joyful and promoting of the other in this power of God's Spirit. So I want to attempt three things in our talk time tonight. The first is to look at what the Bible says about God's design in creating us. Uh, what was his plan for our relationships? Um, that's what we're going to do in turning to Genesis 1. And secondly, I then want to look at what the Bible reveals to us about what has changed. Why are human relationships now so troubled and so different from God's intent in the beginning? 
And thirdly, I, I want to take us to Romans, which Laith read for us earlier, to a couple of different uh, points in Romans to see that Jesus offers to us the certainty of a life transformed. Um, being a Christian is not actually only about looking forward to salvation and heaven in the future. It's about being radically changed now in this life to be able to relate in a manner that glory, glorifies God and is a blessing to those that he places a, us amongst. So that's what we're going to be thinking about tonight. And I realise it's only a very preliminary or small attempt to speak to the issue of domestic violence and transformed relationships, but we just want to keep having this conversation and building on it because I think we all agree this is one of the most grievous aspects of uh, Australian society at the moment. So we're making a start. Let's begin by discussing relationships where the Bible does in the creation account of Genesis 1. For many of us, I think these are very familiar words. We've probably read them maybe hundreds of times. They're very familiar. But what I want to emphasise to you is as we as Christians start to think about an issue like domestic violence, um, we need to recognise that our world is also thinking about this issue very, very carefully. And they're not familiar with the Bible, by and large, and Genesis 1 is not familiar to them. And so what we're going to look at here and what God's word provides us in Genesis 1 is actually a unique insight into God's intention that our world doesn't know about and which may be very, very helpful for us to be aware of for our conversations with our friends. God's design was to create us for relationship, for relationship with him and with each other. And the Bible holds out to us the encouragement uh, that, <clears throat> sorry, the Bible holds out the encouragement and challenge that we have an extraordinary capacity as human beings for good relationships. In Genesis 1, we discover why we have such a profound capacity for good and wholesome relationships. We have been created and made in the image and likeness of God who is the God of perfect relationship and perfect love. And so in verses 26 to 27, we read, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Humanity has this uh, extraordinary capacity to relate to God, to each other and to the world because of who God is, in whose image we've been made. Because we're made in his likeness, in the likeness of the perfect God, perfect love, we are capable of enjoying extraordinary relationships. You might notice that in verses 26 to 28, God has specifically designed us with the powers of relationship for a very specific task that he's entrusted to us. It's the task of ruling over his creation on his behalf. This responsibility for the good governance of the world is envisaged to be one that we carry together, that is, in partnership with one another, so remember the words God explains, so that they may rule over. Relationship is therefore stitched into the fibre of who we are and for the purpose of what we're designed to do. It's noteworthy that there is no competition in the task of ruling between men and women. This is really significant, a very significant point God's word makes. Remarkably, this 4,000-year-old text reveals that men and women are equally created in the image of God and equally entrusted with the responsibility of ruling God's creation together. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them, verse 27. And so inherent to their biological difference is a difference in how they will each contribute to this relationship of rule over creation with a focus on childbearing and child rearing as a means of multiplying the human capacity for ruling on God's behalf over all of creation. 
Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Men and women are created complementary partners in ruling over creation as God's image bearers. So this is God's good design for his world. And we can see that God then provides wonderfully for this relationship of rule to succeed. In verse 29, we read God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God looks at this situation that he has created with men and women caring for his world. He's fully provided for it in every way. And he says, this is very, very good. So there is the picture of God's intention in designing us as those he entrusts the rule of his world with. As we reflect on the current state of our world then, there is therefore much to lament in the ways that humanity have fallen far short of this mandate. And if you're uh, here tonight and you're a little sceptical about the Bible, whether it's reliable, uh, you might read that description in Genesis 1 and think that is simply not realistic. That is not what the world is like. No one relates like that. Um, and you might be tempted to think that the Bible is therefore out of step with reality. So I want to push us on to Genesis 3 and ask the question, well, why isn't the world like this now? And why aren't our relationships what God intended them to be? And I want to encourage you to see that the Bible is actually... Uh, very honest in acknowledging that this is not the way things are now and it gives us a very compelling explanation of why they're not how God intended them to be. So let's ask why things aren't so good anymore. Uh, Genesis 3 is the account of the moment when Satan tempts Adam and Eve to eat the fruit in the one tree in the garden that he said, don't eat that tree. Uh, and Satan succeeds and they eat and the consequences for their relationship with God and with each other are very grave. Uh, he, he speaks, God speaks to Satan, which I won't uh, cover tonight. Then he speaks to the woman in spelling out the consequences of her actions. Then he speaks to Adam, the man, in spelling out the consequences for his actions. And we discover that the consequences for what they have done are relational consequences. This is very significant. God says to Eve, the woman, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labour you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Genesis 3.16. Now I hope you noticed what the author of Genesis had very carefully done right there. We've just been reading about God's intention for the man and woman to equally rule over creation and now hear how devastating that consequence is god says now adam will attempt to rule over you so it's actually an undoing of god's good intentions and the consequence is devastating to the relationship where they had been equally designed to rule over creation the result of this act of their joint disobedience is that now Adam the man will exercise rule over Eve or at least attempt to. This is not an indication that God has stripped Eve of her equality to Adam. Very important. This is not an indication that God has stripped Eve of her equality to Adam. She remains an equal image bearer of God as she has always been. But this is indicative of the reality of Adam's new impulse in the relationship as a result of sin. His impulse will now sadly be to rule alone. Very foolish, but he will seek to rule alone and over. Here is the seedbed for all future relationship difficulties, not only for men and women, perhaps particularly for men and women, but in fact for all relationships. 
Notice that God is not endorsing this impulse on Adam's part. Does, God does not declare this to be a good impulse or a good thing. It is rather a sad consequence of Adam and Eve's sin. And the effect of their sin, as you know, or as you may know, is not restricted to their relationship. In the next few chapters, we see things unravel terribly as Adam and Eve's own children then struggle with the reality of violence as Cain attacks his own brother Abel. And in the generations that follow, the world becomes a society that is so marred by sin that God determines to put a stop to it all through the global flood of Noah's time. Notice that where God had provided wonderfully for Adam and Eve to rule over his creation so that they had whatever they needed, they didn't need to work, now this changes in God's word to Adam. He removes his provision, Genesis 3 verse 17, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are and to dust you will return. So God removes the provision of food, uh, at least free food, uh, and more significantly he removes the provision of life itself. Adam and Eve will now return to the dust from which they were taken in death. Here then is the Bible's frank explanation for the way things now are in our world. And sadly, the Bible's explanation is an entirely realistic uh, uh, description of relationships in this world. The Bible explains to us what has gone wrong. So before we look at uh, the great promise of God's solution, let's just think about what this means for our relationships for a moment. Firstly, we want to say that the difficulty this spells for relationships cannot there be, therefore be underestimated. So I think you feel the weight of this, don't you? As you think about how we relate as humans, uh, how men and women relate in relationship and particularly within marriage, Genesis 1 and 3 bring us a reality that's very uncomfortable. The problem is very deep. Sin is a heart issue. Uh, it's very problematic. So we might secondly say to be able to live out the wonderful vision of God's created design, we're going to need an incredible intervention on God's part to enable us to live his way rather than simply live out the pattern that sin has brought into our relationships. We're going to need God's intervention in our lives. Thirdly, before we look at the solution, we want to therefore stop and affirm that what we've just read about human relationships, their brokenness and the sadness that we often experience in them, uh, as we do, the Bible does not affirm sin. And so to quote the domestic violence or domestic abuse policy of our diocese, the Bible rejects all abuse, whether physical, verbal or otherwise expressed from one person to another, and always condemns the misuse of power to control or exploit others. Therefore, domestic abuse is evil. Such sin is deceptive in its power and damaging in its effects. And we want to be bold in stating that that is the case, that that's our expectation as Christian people for our relationships, that abuse has no place in our homes, in the church or in society. So let's turn to the second Bible reading and uh, a closely related passage from Romans 8 and see what wonderful hope the Bible brings for our relationships. The Bible holds out great hope, great optimism for our relationships in this life to be able to express the intention God had for love and relationship. This is not only true for domestic or household relationships, but for all relationships between humans. The Bible is unapologetic in its clear call to humanity to see that because the problem of broken relationship and abuse runs so deep, 
The solution to hu the human problem of broken relationships, violence and war is also primarily a spiritual one. The solution is primarily spiritual. This is not to undermine or underestimate the importance of secular programs which aim to provide ways for people to change their habits in the way they relate. So we want to uh, encourage each other to make the most of every opportunity to be changed, whether it's through secular services like counselling, therapy, psychology, anger management programs. Uh, these are all good and we should encourage people to make every use of them as the church. However, one of the key concerns we have as a society is the issue of a person's heart motivation and the question of what motivates a person to change and enables them to change long term. And the Bible unapolog unapologetically calls us to recognise that there is a primary spiritual issue that must be resolved and which can only be resolved by God. The passage we read earlier from Romans 13 speaks to this. As Paul writes to the Roman believers about their struggle, their ongoing struggle with sin, and encourages them to continually turn away from it. Uh, so hear that challenge again from Romans 13 verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves has fulfilled the law. Uh, he says, don't sin, but love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. And we hear that, and, and I would say our world hears that. They may not even be concerned to believe in the Bible or follow Jesus particularly, but I think our world hears that and would wholeheartedly agree that that is, that is what we want for our relationships. Uh, and so you'll hear people from time to time say, that's the golden rule. Love other people as you love yourself. Our world agrees on this principle. But of course, the problem we've already touched on tonight is, yes, that's, that's the ideal, but we seem to struggle to reach it. We seem to struggle to be able to um, pursue that objective consistently. So what hope is there? Well, if we turn back a little way in our Bible to Romans 8, uh, I want to read a couple of sections to you uh, which bring us God's answer to how we might truly enjoy transformed relationships. As Paul writes to his Roman friends uh, and recognises their struggle with sin, he teaches them that they now have a new power to resist sin and say no to it and it is the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in each believer. And so as we uh, open Romans 8, verse 9, here are Paul's words to them. He says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Did you hear the wonderful power of what Paul is talking about there? It is the undoing of the curse that God has just, or well, we've heard God just explain to Adam that he will return to the dust. Now Paul reminds the Romans that they have now received the spirit of life who will indeed raise them to new life. They will not experience everlasting death but everlasting life through the transformative power of God's spirit. But as I said earlier, it is not only eternity that the Christian has to look forward to. Paul also then goes on to talk about the power of the Spirit for our everyday relationships here and now. In verse 12, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And Paul's emphasis there is on the Spirit's ability to take 
any person, any person who will trust Jesus as Lord and accept his spirit into their life to actually empower them to put sin to death. It's an incredible offer of new life. Not just eternity, but new life, a new way of life now, empowered by God. And so as Jesus says to us, a new command I give to you, love one another, just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another, John 13. Uh, We might say, well, I can never live out that kind of high standard. But Jesus says to us, I've given you my spirit. He is able to empower you to live my way. Yes, you'll continue to struggle with sin, but he will empower you to say no and to continually be transformed more and more into the likeness of the Lord Jesus. So what does this say to us tonight? Well, a couple of things to finish with. The first is I realise this issue is a a very painful one for anyone who's been through a domestic abuse situation. Um, And so if that is you tonight, uh, I want to encourage you, um, if you need to talk with someone, pray with someone, there are wonderful services available in our community, in our church, and even in this room, there are people who would love to talk with you and pray tonight. And certainly I'm happy for you to to chat with me or contact me privately if that's something that you need help addressing in your life. Uh, It takes great courage to do so. Um, But as we've seen from God's word tonight, God's ideal for relationship is safe, loving relationships uh, where you're cared for. So as a church family, we want to encourage you to find that. But secondly, perhaps um, you're sitting here tonight and you're convicted that the way you live uh, actually doesn't measure up to God's standard. Now, I know this is true for every single one of us to some degree. Um, None of us quite will, will ever measure up to Jesus' perfect love. But it's possible you're sitting here tonight and you're conscious that your habits include abusing others and you might be sitting here thinking, I want to change, but I really don't want to tell anyone about this area of my life, I really want to encourage you um, to be courageous and brave and to see that God actually encourages us to um, deal with our sin, not to keep it in the dark, but to deal with it and to be bold because ultimately it's the power of his spirit who enables us to change. Uh, That takes great courage to come forward about that, um, but this is a community that's safe to bring up these things and to actually seek people's encouragement, a trusted friend uh, or your pastor to be prayed for and to seek help. Thirdly, I want to encourage us too just to see how wonderful uh, the hope of Jesus is. So um, we've been given this great word of life. Um, I think a lot of the time the gospel gets caricatured as just this message about the future, that when you die, you can have new life and forgiveness then. But as we talk about it in that way, we overlook the profound um, usefulness and blessing that the gospel can be to us and to our neighbours in everyday life. It can transform your life. And so we have been given words of eternal life that can be a great blessing to our neighbours. Um, It helps them in their relationships to live God's way and to be a blessing to those that they love. So don't underestimate the power of the gospel and the power of God's spirit to bring hope and change to any person's life that you share it with. So if they say, I'm not interested in that stuff, um, don't completely give up on them. Keep praying, recognising there may come an opportunity to speak to them about areas of their life that they're unhappy with and that God offers to transform. Let's pray now that we might be people who walk in the power of God's spirit and live transformed lives. Our loving Father, we praise and thank you for your goodness to us in creating us for relationship and for your goodness to us in displaying perfect relationship and love to us. We thank you, Father, that even while we were your enemies, you displayed love to us in sending your Son 
who died for us and has ransomed us. And Father, we thank you for the great encouragement of your word to us tonight, that being transformed doesn't rely on our own strength. We thank you for the gift of your own spirit, who you have generously provided to all who believe, so that through his power we might be transformed. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd make us bold and courageous uh, to deal with our sin, to admit our faults, to ask for your forgiveness, but also, Heavenly Father, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind through the power of your spirit. And we pray all this, Lord, that we might live lives that glorify you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.